So we're going to continue with the theme of uh, ancient fish or fish that have been around a long time. And this includes the polyodontidae, which are the paddlefishes. Um, again, this group is easy to identify. You should never mistake a paddlefish for anything else. If you do, you are in the wrong class. Um, I just want to talk about them a little bit, give you some interesting um, details about this fish and this family of fish. So we're still in the subclass Chondrostii. So this is in the group of bony fishes, Actinoporygii, but this is a subclass where the bones are actually cartilage, cartilage skeleton, ancient fishes. And we talked about the sturgeon, now we're going to talk about the paddlefish. That's the only two groups in this subclass. So the paddlefish, um, a lot of people call them spoonbill catfish. If you hear about people talking about, the people that talk about uh, snagging spoons, this is what they're talking about. Uh, very easy fish to recognize. Obviously, it's got this incredibly large paddle-shaped rostrum. And below that rostrum, you see that it has an extremely large mouth. So these fish, and they grow very large, but they're planktivores. They eat uh, mostly zooplankton, and they just filter feed. They just open up that big mouth. You can kind of see down into that mouth. There's a lot of big, uh, widely spaced gill rakers that are designed to trap zooplankton. And here's just another um, example. Very cool looking fish. The only other paddlefish in the world, the only uh, relative to the paddlefish we have here in Kentucky, is the Yangtze paddlefish, which is found in China, but it hadn't been found in a while. Uh, there's some question whether or not this fish has gone extinct. I'm not really sure when the last time they found one, but the last I heard, they hadn't seen them for a long time, um, probably because of um, habitat degradation, pollution of the rivers, and so this species might be extinct. I don't really know, but that's the only other paddlefish in the whole world. And here's another picture. There's not a whole lot of pictures that I can find online of these fish because they're not super common. So just like the sturgeon, these are big river fish. They can travel long distances. Um, they're also fished for caviar. And so this group, this group tends to produce very big, very nutritious eggs, which makes them good for caviar. I mentioned last time that I found that caviar shop where they were listed, they were selling American Savruga, and it was very cheap. Well, that American Savruga caviar is actually paddlefish caviar. The Savruga sturgeon is a type of sturgeon in Europe that they make Savruga caviar from. They just, the marketers called it American Savruga just to disguise the fact that it's not really even a sturgeon. At any rate, that is something that these fish have been fished for. They've also been, um, they also have tasty flesh, um, especially when it's smoked. And so their obvious distinctive feature is that large rostrum. Why do they have it? There's actually a couple of reasons. One is that it's used for electroreception. And we'll talk about electrogeneration and electroreception in fish later on in the semester. But basically, they can use it to detect subtle electric fields in the water. Now, these fish are filter feeders. So I'm assuming that they're just looking for large aggregations of plankton, you know, places where there's a whole big patch of plankton very densely that they can detect the electric field on. I don't think they're detecting individual zooplankters with this. Another reason that they have this big rostrum is to counteract the downward pull while they're filter feeding. So again, if you look at the mouth, they have this huge mouth. And when the fish is going along, it's going to drop that mouth and just swim and let the water flow through its gill rakers. But when you drop that big mouth like that, that creates a lot of drag. And if you've got that mouth dropping on that fish, that's going to tend to pull the fish down. And if they don't have anything to counteract it, they just swim in big circles like this, right? And so by having that large rostrum, the mouth is pulling down, but the rostrum 
is resisting that pull down and it helps to hold them straight in the water column. And something that I noticed, uh, there's a couple of students that I took out, um, this was up by Keokuk, Iowa, where I used to work, and we would catch a lot of paddlefish where the rostrum was broken off. And presumably this happens a lot due to boat traffic. They tend to hang out near the surface. If you got a lot of boat traffic, it's very easily for them to get hit by a prop. And clearly they can survive without it, but obviously they're better off with it. As I mentioned, just like the sturgeon, they make long migrations, long movement, uh, movements, probably for spawning. And consequently, the dams on the big rivers have a negative impact on them. It inhibits them from um, making these long migrations. Now, here's the big caveat with that. We have been collecting a lot of data on fish that we've tagged in Kentucky Lake. And we've been detecting a lot of paddlefish that were tagged by the Missouri Department of Conservation. And they, and they were released in the Mississippi River, yet we're tagging, we're tracking them in Kentucky Lake. So clearly they were able to make it through the dam at Kentucky Lake to get upstream from that dam. And several fish have done that. So they are able to make it past these dams, but of course it's not easy and they'd be better off without the dams there. Now, just to give you an example of how far these fish can travel, this is a story that was about uh, uh, several years ago, 20, 2009, 2010. But there was a tagged paddlefish that was caught below Barkley Dam on the Cumberland River. Now, when that tag was called in, the fish was identified to have been tagged in South Dakota in June of 2009. And the, the fishermen caught it below Barkley Dam in June of 2010. And so that fish swam down the Missouri, down the Mississippi to Cairo, turned left, went up the Ohio, and up the Cumberland in one year before it was caught by that fisherman. And that's the minimum amount of travel. So it just goes to show you the large trips and migrations that these fish can make. All right, so that was just a little bit about paddlefish. And um, obviously, they're very easy to identify. Very cool fish. Family Polyodontidae. Let me know if you got any questions, and see ya.